All right, I want to welcome everybody into the Fifth Dimension Podcast. I am Evan McDermott. For this show, I was joined live in studio by Libby Androwski, who she herself says she is not made for the internet, but I beg to differ after this conversation. We really went all over the place, you know, talking about the cyclical nature of man and the soul's journey, past lives, hope. All these different topics, there's a lot to unpack here, a lot to explore, and I hope you guys enjoy this conversation as much as I did. It's always cool to be able to do live interviews here in the studio and bring new people in. The circle is expanding, my friends, so hope you guys enjoy this conversation. If you're a fan of the show, be sure to subscribe whatever platform you are on, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever it may be, you know how to subscribe, leave us a review, leave a comment. All of that is greatly appreciated as it helps us in the algorithms and more people can find the show. You can also purchase my poetry book, To Marshall Love Against Tyranny. As you can see, it is over my right shoulder behind me. Got a new poetry collection coming out in the next month or two, so stay tuned. Head on over to my Substack page, mcdermott.substack.com, m-c-d-e-r-m-o-d.substack.com. You subscribe there, it's free. You'll be notified for every podcast, new poetry, articles, anything that I feel like sharing on there. It's all there. McDermott.substack.com, best way to keep up with what we're doing here and what I'm doing overall with all my different work because it's kind of all over the place. So without further ado, I almost forgot our official sponsor, Tranquil Desires, Chamberlain, South Dakota. Check them out. Link to their Facebook is in the episode show notes. Patty has done a great deal to help this show, and I am greatly appreciative of her and for her being such a wonderful, warming presence in my own life. So thank you to Tranquil Desires for being our only official sponsor. If you want to be a sponsor, I guess you can hit me up. But for right now, I feel content with her as a sponsor. If you want to donate to the show, you can do so below. And without further ado, let's jump into the podcast with Libby, who she herself says she is not made for the internet. I will let you be the judge. Enjoy. Everybody, welcome into the Fifth Dimension Podcast. I'm joined by Livy. What's up? Not not meant for the internet. Not meant for the internet. Not meant for the internet. <laughs> not meant for cameras. And yet here you are. No, I should have been behind the scenes somewhere. <laughs> this is this is not usually my forte. And yet here I am sticking a microphone in your face. Yeah. Because you said. Because I said you could, yes. Because I, I because she said I could. And I therefore, guess I agreed, kind of. Therefore, you agreed. There is a there is. Nobody comes on this show without consent. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't forced. The answer was sure. And I still ended up here somehow. There was no definite yes on this. <laughs> beautiful, 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 beautiful. Well, we're just going to shoot the shit and figure out where we go along. I have no idea. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, I guess I would start. You're like, I don't know. everything. Every story you tell me, I'm like, this person is like, fascinating fascinating very phenomenal so i i want i want to give the the listeners a little taste of of your like mindset in the way you live life okay. in a sense because you kind of have valued experience you have valued kind of just throwing yourself out into the world in a sense i mean you literally one of the first things we talked about was yeah, I just went to a beach and decided I was going to die on a beach and then I got rescued. I mean, there's just there's just so much shit where it's like wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You want can you can you, can you like give me a little taste of that? What is it what does that what does that mean? Give me give me a little taste of your mindset. Of my mindset yeah. is it's really stabilized chaos. So, like when I went to the beach, everything was chaotic when I started. Yeah. And then when I got there, that's when the stabilization came. So every time something gets chaotic, I go find myself again. So when I got chaotic in the Virgin Islands, I went to Alaska, spent time up there, almost got eaten by a bear. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> Polar bear? No, it was probably just a, it was the middle of the night. I'm walking down the road like an idiot. And in the middle of Alaska in December, it's always dusk, always dusk. Okay. And uh, I decided I want to go for a walk. Never been to Alaska. Never seen a bear. Don't have any idea what I'm doing. And I get maybe 300 yards from the front door I was staying at. And I heard, like, growling in the 
Like just them, they chuff almost, they don't growl, I guess. But I heard it up in the woods and I'm standing in the middle of this road looking at the ocean and I'm like, what am I doing? It is the middle of the night in Alaska. Like I need to go home. So I started walking home and I heard it like slide down the ravine on the side of the cliff and I turned around and he was just standing there like on top of the rock. I don't know what kind of like if it was male, female, I've got no idea. Just huge and staring at me. And I took off running. You ran? Yeah, dumb. <laughs> oh my god. South Dakota girl meets a bear. What'd she do? Run. Oh, bear safety 101, not run. <laughs> I got back and told the people I was staying with, and they were like, You ran? And I was like, What was I supposed to do? It didn't chase you? It just it was up on top of a bunch of rocks. Dude, it didn't matter if it chased me. I wasn't looking back or hearing anything but the blood in my ears. Oh my god. <laughs> There's no way. If I got eaten, I was doing it running, let me tell you. You know, they're not gonna, like, 99% of bear encounters are not gonna eat you. No, they have plenty of garbage and stuff up there to eat. The fishing industry is huge up there, so they always pick through, like, the fish so that come in. The, the bear didn't even think it was, you were worth its time. No, he, he not didn't even running. give a fuck. He was really like, <laughs> what a joke. Yeah, he was probably like, why is she running? <laughs> <laughs> i just want to be friends yeah, that's extra work <laughs> oh my goodness okay 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 i hadn't heard that one yep. I, I like that where did you so where did you end up after alaska like what is what has sort of been the finding because I, I like that theme of finding like stability through chaos because right. i think i've kind of done the same thing in a lot of ways i mean i can dive deep into that mm -hmm. certainly but or is the next spot? What yeah, what what is how did that journey continue? How did that journey unfold from chaos into stability? So I actually went up there to see a friend, yeah. an old friend of mine. And uh I was probably up there a couple months. I got to check it out, really look around, spend time in the little town that was on the island. It was a lot of fun. But it just wasn't what I wanted in life. Mm -hmm. So I hopped back on a plane from Sidka back down to the Virgin Islands and on that plane from Sidka to the Virgin Islands was another couple from the island I lived on huh. all the way up in Sidka Alaska just chilling in an airport and I was like are you guys really going and they were like yeah so we traveled the entire way back down together we even took the ferry back over together in their car back to our island and I was there for probably another year until COVID hit Okay, then he came back this way. Yeah, well, that's when it got real bad. Real crazy. Yeah. Okay, okay. Now, so what do you think, like, the... I don't want to say, not the reason behind, like, chaos into stability, but do you think, in general, that's something that is that a lot of people do is the reason for their, like, whether it's self-sabotage or for... You know, kind of throwing their life into disarray. Do you think they do it for a, for almost like kind of testing ourselves? Like, let me, let me, let me see what, let me see how, because this is something I've done. And I think unconsciously. Right. Let me see how far I can throw myself down this flight of stairs and then walk back up, you know, with, with just fine without mm -hmm. destroying my, without dying, essentially. Right. right. Kind of throwing myself into the flames. Why, why do you think we do that? And it doesn't, it doesn't have to be you in particular or drawn to your particular experience. Why do, you, why do you think we do that? I think everybody as a person grows up in some form of chaos. Okay. Everybody. Whether, and we all perceive chaos differently, you know, through each other's eyes. Perception is reality. And if your chaos is your reality, a lot of people have learned to live and grow through their own chaos. So as they get older, I think a lot of people really are just comfortable with that level of disarray in their life and when that stops happening and yeah. they're uncomfortable again they're waiting for that other boot to drop is when they cause that chaos to come back in because that feels normal then they have something to fix they have something to accomplish it gives them a purpose hmm. the stability is uncomfortable yes the stability is uncomfortable what now that feels like a deeper symptom to me of something that because i think you're right 
but if we look at it on sort of a larger scale, that feels like a, a symptom of a of a deeper issue on how we're organizing ourselves and what our priorities are. Because what would life be like if we decided to embrace the stability? Right. <laughs> if we decided to actually say, you know what? I deserve to be stable and happy and I don't need my life to be in total disarray right. to actually find a sense of purpose here. But I, I also think, you know, to turn that on his head a little bit, maybe we thrive best when we're actually faced with challenge, faced with hardship. Yeah. So we need to have a little bit of hardship. We need to have a little bit of challenge. And I think when we're hunter and gatherers, or just fighting to survive without the comforts of civilization, we're faced with challenge every day. And so we need to, we need to put ourselves up to the rigor as a, like an evolutionary, like trait, you know, maybe that's just in our DNA. That's like what we need. Like we can't not be in disarray or can't not have something to test ourselves against. Well, you've got to think like as a, as a species we are a chaotic species everything on earth takes and gives in the same circle right everything a snail eats leaves it gives back when it dies right or it feeds a bird or humans are the only things that take in chaos Hmm. we are the only things that do not regularly give back what we've taken and we've done that for thousands of years. Do you think that's in our nature or is it a conditioned behavior? I think it's a little bit of both. I think in our nature, mentally, we need that chaos. Mentally, we have the need to take yeah. and to grow and to further things. Yeah. Um, but I also think that it's very learned. There are ways that humans can do better to give back. But we are so consumed with the easy way yeah, that it's just simpler and unfortunately more cost effective. Consumption, 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 yeah. consumption without any re- recipro- reciprocity. Is that the right word? Reciprocity. Because I, I tend to think consuming is a, natu- a natural phenomenon, mm-hmm. kind of like you said. But I think the 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 not giving back to me, that's what feels like the conditioned behavior mm-hmm. in this day and age. Right. Because, I mean, when we're, not to go back to hunter-gatherers, I'm glorifying this hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Oh, no. <laughs> I long for the days. I long for the days. <laughs> long for return to the days of old. Oh, yes. But to me, it feels like in that state, in a sense, we would be naturally giving back back in some sense i mean because giving back could just be giving to the community wouldn't it i mean you're watering your community you're watering your tribe or your people and kind of you know you give back to the earth let's say the let's say you slaughter an animal you give back to the earth the the bones you're not eating or whatever it is you know and it decomposes and rots and you know we're giving back with our waste whatever it is and it uh, natural byproducts but in this day and age, what we give back tends to be a, I tend to think we pour our negativity into our, that's what we, that's what we're giving to the earth in a sense. Oftentimes, you know, we, uh, we consume mindlessly and in turn we give back mindlessly. Yeah. Know? That's, that's kind of what it feels like, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if there, the, the problem is, I don't know if there's a solution to that. There's probably a solution, but probably not one that everybody would agree on. All right, what would be your solution? To give back? Yeah, to solve that sort of mindless mindless reciprocity system we've created. We've already started it. Like, our age group, maybe a little bit older, probably 35 and younger, a lot of them are starting to give back to their communities. A lot of them are you know, making breads, canning vegetables, they're raising animals well for meat and all of that kind of stuff. I think a lot of our generation has already started that. So the actual solution is to continue to learn that behavior, like you said, onto the generation after. It's going to take a very, very, very long time. If I could fix it tomorrow, I would make 
yeah, I, you know, <laughs> yeah, perfect world. If I could snap my fingers tomorrow, I would take away a lot of things and replace it with a lot of things. But it's going to take years and years and years, and hopefully, I see it within my lifetime. Do you think that would? So, do you think that would shatter the current framework we have for our society now? Yes. Now, with the shattering of the current framework, you're a bit of a you're a little bit of a prepper. <laughs> you're a little bit of a prepper. Not that that's put you on the spot. Does that do you do you think that means a total systematic collapse in the sense where because it, realistically, there's so many people right who have built their entire lives on the system on the way we live our life and this mindless consumption, regardless of if there's people who are doing this or not like you're saying and i agree with you there's going to be people who are not right and so total systematic collapse almost means if you're going to have a new thing in place the old way has to die right, right? and that also means the way people are living has to change mm -hmm. but if, if people aren't changing now when shit hits the fan right it, it's total chaos mm -hmm. right so do, do you think there's going to be a day, and this is not to be like a doomer in a sense, because I like to leave people with a little optimism. <laughs> a little bit. I try to at least. Do you think there's going to be a time when we have like a a total overhaul or systematic collapse where people are going to need to fend for themselves? And d does that mean people are warring with their neighbors over scraps? And like what? Because you're a prepper. You're a prepper. Right. And I, 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 there's a reason you prep. And I think it's a good thing to do. Do you anticipate something like that as a real possibility? I really think it's going to go one of two ways. All right, let's hear I it. really, really do. I think either the system's going to collapse, people are going to lose their minds like rabid animals because it has been so long that we've been dependent on the things that we have, on the mm. systems we do have. We have ingrained ourselves into those systems, whether we want to believe it or not. Whether people say, you know... I don't follow those laws. I think they're wrong or I, whatever you believe, I think that uh, everybody's ingrained in one way or another. So okay. people are either going to freak out and they are going to start fighting over scraps and they're going to start pillaging and they're going to start rioting and mm. everything's going to burn to the ground. The worst of human behavior. Yeah. Okay. Or everybody that still holds that real old mentality of you got to fight hard you got to scrape your knees you got to bloody your knuckles to get what you want are far enough away from our generation that we can all come together there are going to be ones that don't right there are going to be ones that say screw that i want anarchy i'm going to yep. shoot things and skin mm -hmm. cars fine purge day that's cool. You do you, dude. But eventually, laws are always going to be replaced. People in charge are always going to be replaced. Things that are happening, we repeat consistently as humans. Over mm -hmm. thousands of years, we've repeated the same customs for thousands of years. Kings, queens, the, the whole... The whole system we've had for thousands of years that's not going to change but i would think that the next time if those people are far enough away we will get a better slew of people in maybe with a different idea a different constitution and a different mindset or we get a dictator and you know that's just, <laughs> that's just the end of it but fair enough fair enough well i you know i'm very much like in the mindset that I don't know. I, how do I word this? Not that I'm, I would say I'm an anarchist, mm -hmm. right? I'm not an anarchist totally. I think hierarchy is a natural phenomenon across the animal kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. There's, you look at a wolf pack, you have different roles within the, the different wolves have the different roles. So I think things like government and things like systems, they're a, they, they should be a natural byproduct of our own hierarchy and what we're prioritizing now i would like to think 
I would like to think if we were, let's say we had a whole systematic collapse and everybody is forced to sit with themselves. Cause that's what they're going to have to do first. They're going to have to sit with themselves. They're going right. to have to be like, Oh, I need to be self-sufficient. Oh, I need to, I don't know how to do this. Uncle Joe down the street knows how to do this. Let, 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 let's see if him and I can band together. You know, right. you start coming together in that way. That's going to be the only way of survival. Right. And so if you have a little time period where you're forced to become dependent upon just within your community, but also have a, a role in self-sufficiency uh, naturally after a period such as that we would create systems that value each individual role and each individual expression and you have leaders who put trust within the people because otherwise you're right we're just going to get a dictator from the top down and be like this is what we're doing yada 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 and you know i see a lot of people nowadays it's like we need uh a Christian nation, or we need this, we need this value system, we need these morals, we need this. And realistically, at the end of the day, none of that stuff's going to work because it's no. just going to repeat the same old, it's, it'd be like crusades all over again, or it'd be like, you know, any other, give you any other extremist type of ideology. It's just what's going to, that's what would happen. And I, but I, what my worry would be is people in times of chaos, a lot of people don't want to save themselves. People don't want to save themselves. They want to go to somebody, be my savior, help me, lead me to the light, you know? Yeah. And so somebody who comes in and this, if you're to go into, you're going to make it a, a religious story. This is like the idea of, of an antichrist. I like the idea of like the story behind it. Cause I think it's, it's an interesting way to look at it. Somebody who comes in and gives you all these false promises and gives you this like, Hey, I got you, you know, follow my way. Yeah. Right. And I, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, gravitate towards that type of mentality. So when we're looking at, all right, let's build a whole new world. People might be swayed by the illusions of a false prophet. Well, we've had that once already. It yeah. caused a, an entire world war. Yeah. You know, we've seen people do that time and time and time again. Well, it's it's like you hijack the the psycho the psyche of the collective mind instill an ideology and boom you can get people to do anything instill a fear instill a fear what do you think people fear most Ooh, that's a good question what do you fear most what do i fear most yeah start at the individual level and if that's too personal you don't have to answer no uh i fear complete and utter loneliness true loneliness nobody would even look my way if my name flashed across their phone hmm. that's my fear yeah so probably one of my deepest fears too yeah true loneliness true isolation because i value is i value isolation right. and solitude but true loneliness where there is nobody to turn to in a sense and there is nobody and i tend to think the the world at large and the collective is very much a macrocosm for the individual experience, mm -hmm. right? So that would, if we're looking at that perspective, let's say loneliness is people's biggest fear. So just like you, I think millions of people across the world, if not billions, have that same exact deeply rooted fear. So if that is, the, if that is their deeply rooted fear, loneliness, well, let's say somebody hijacks that fear. Mm -hmm. Right? They hijack. All right, these people are lonely. What do we? What do? What do they want? Realistically, we want love. We want connection. We want so. But if you can create an ideology based around, all right, we're gonna we're gonna hit the main points of this person's fear and and, and make it feel like they're not lonely. Right? Let let's bring them together around this. People very very easily can be swayed. Right? And that's that's what worries me about the direction we're moving in because i do think i have hope about the future i like to think the world is going to change for the better but if you look at the same cycles of history time and time again people get caught in the trap of their minds being warped tribalism where they go into something oh this is what everybody else is doing i don't want to be the outsider i don't want to be the outcast yeah boom they got you. Oh, yeah. That's, well, that's essentially, like, the state. 
This is exactly like that. Nobody wants to stand out here because the fear of being shunned is too high. Hmm. Hmm. Because it's a collective. Yeah. And you're ta- you're referring to like culture. Yeah. The culture of the state. Yeah. Oh, God. Not the people per se, but the culture, the way kids are raised here. It's very closed off. You don't realize that either here until you leave. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and what's interesting is I think each place has their oh, yeah. their cultural norms and their way of, I mean, if I were to go to some village in Africa, you know, yeah. I'm sure I'd face the same type of isolation. Yeah. And you'd only find one or two people Yeah. who are like, oh, you're unique. Right. <laughs> you're cool. Right. But you've got to compare that to this is the middle of my own country. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And we are so separate, like, right now as a country that it kind of sucks. Right. Well, do you think there's a a different value system that is, like, let's say, all right, the state of South Dakota, right? They have their culture, they have their values, they have their way of living, which we both experience, versus, I don't know, name any other state, California, Mississippi, Florida, Tennessee, New Hampshire, wherever it is anywhere in the state, they're all going to have their own culture and values. Now, if somebody from South Dakota picks up, decides, I'm going to go to, I'm I'm going to go to New Hampshire and they, they go in with their South Dakota mindset, right? They're going to face that same shunning, that same like isolation, ostracization. I think that's a word. Right. But even in my own country, I can pick up on that. You know, that's the difference. If I take off to London tomorrow Mm -hmm. and I walked in, I faced that same isolation. I could not navigate that properly. Do you think you should be able to navigate it here? Right. Well, we're within our, in the, it's interesting in the United States, we're a very like, we're a very divided country, but we're also like, I don't know. There's a way to, there is a way to navigate that and kind Mm -hmm. of pick into what the cultural norms are and make yourself fit in a little bit. And I think that's what a lot of people do. They kind of go somewhere and instead of being themselves, they try and fit in. Right. Right. I mean, here's the problem though. Is there a way, I don't want to phrase this as a question. Is there a way to actually kind of create a world based on a, a bigger story than the one we're telling about ourselves? Because I think it comes down to, how we define ourselves, stories we tell about ourselves, what we value as a culture. And in order to actually find some sort of common unity amongst people across different cultures, you kind of need to almost uproot the culture that is present. Right. Is that even, I don't, I don't know how that's possible on a global scale. I really don't know if it would be, you know, you'd have to convince every single person that, Hey, we can do this together. And I mean, At the end of the day, if I could convince every single person and be like, hey, listen to me, billions of years ago, two stars collided, everything became dust, and out of that stardust, you ended up on this rock talking to me in the middle of a street billions of years later because something happened right. Like, if you could get every human to just think that for just a second, put aside all your religious guff, all of your, you know whether it's racism, religion, education, you know, whatever it comes down to, if you could put that aside for a second and just think, holy jeez, I'm floating on a rock in the middle of nothingness Mm. having a conversation. Nobody thinks that's immaculate. Everybody just walks through everyday life like, like they were meant to be here. Nobody's meant to be here. It could have just as easily not happened. Mm -hmm. And I think we all forget that as people. Take it for granted. Yeah. The beauties of life. Yeah. The the miraculousness of existence. Right. None of this should be here. You and I shouldn't be talking on microphones to people on the internet. You know, like that should <laughs> not be a thing. But something happened billions of years ago, so that could happen. Yeah. And there's beauty in that when yeah. you can actually step back and kind of remember that. Because, you know, the, the root of what I try and explore and figure out is like kind of get people back to that origin point for themselves to like, okay, let me retrace my own steps here. 
right. in the sense of the human experience. And I think there is a disconnect between ourselves and that origin point. Mm -hmm. Even if somebody follows, let's say the Bible, right? And they think the world was created 10,000 years ago. Yeah. You can still trace yourself back to an origin point. You can still trace yourself back to, all right, there's a beginning and therefore there's meaning or there's no meaning, whatever. So yeah. It doesn't matter. Right. But there's, there's a more deeply rooted purpose and connection that's there that I think we can trace into regardless of what somebody tells themselves the story of our man's origins are right right and it kind of gives you a little little footing as you walk through life at the very mm -hmm. least but i i think that's what people tend to be missing and but and and the issue is like man has always been in tribes and the tribes were never bigger than like 150 people realistically back in the day so i don't even know if it's our place to try and change the minds of people to try and get people to do that because what's the point what's the point like i mean like of because if i let's say let's say you do what you just did right and you go and you change everybody every you try and change everybody's opinion all of a sudden you're dictator libby yeah right based on your beliefs what a based, day what a day <laughs> yeah you crave for that day don't you let's go dictator libby. <laughs> what's dictator libby doing on day one Oh man, free French fries for everybody, and I'm going to the beach. <laughs> I better get an airplane. Just saying, like private jet. Oh, for sure. You see, now you're just like the rest of them. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Power is money, baby. Let me tell you. At least you get free French fries out of it. No, I get a plane. No, you get McDonald's. No, now somebody could say she's just giving us French fries to hold us over and yeah. to prevent us from actually stepping into our true power absolutely and so so you see where the issue lies no <laughs> if i'm a dictator that just happened like okay 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 fair enough fair enough we do it anyways like people well, do it anyways now why can't i like if i'm gonna start over if i libby crawley edit that <laughs> get people to pay attention and listen if i get everybody to listen to me yeah I deserve the airplane. Okay, that's all right. Well, yeah, if you can, if you can capture the world's attention, that's certainly. Work. Certainly, I deserve an airplane. What did you do? You got free French fries. So is that tiding you over? Is that rewarding you for not doing anything? Uh, it sounds more like a a placeholder, just to just for so I can again. It sounds like it's repeating the cycle. Aren't you? What if you? What if you wanted to break the cycle? Oh, if I wanted to break the cycle? Yeah, what if you want to break the cycle? Is it possible? Is it possible for one person? I would like to think that it would be possible. Like, if I were to honestly sit down in charge of the world, yeah. you know, I would like to think I would do right. But there are decisions to be made that I will never question because I don't know. Yeah. I'm one person. There's no way you could try. You could sure as heck try, but there will always be somebody that doesn't want to do that. There will always be a group of people that thinks that you're wrong because we are human. Like, you yeah. can never change human nature. That's you fair. can just change the way they deal with nature. That's fair. That's fair. Well, that makes me tend to think that there are no global solutions. There might be. I just might not see it. I, I don't. Personally, I don't. I don't want to say there's no global solutions because then I'm placing a limited belief on myself and then I'm going and I'm creating a self-fulfilling prophecy where I don't act on the betterment of a potential global solution. Right. Right. But I tend to think that people would be better served if they, like the global solution is in the ripple effect of your own individual actions. So where, how you treat people in your community to how you open yourself up to differences, how you, you know, show up for new cultural understanding and a new way and new ideas and new ways of being right mm -hmm. and like oh maybe i don't need to be an asshole okay. right oh maybe i should pay attention to my family huh who'd have thought you right. know shit like that yeah. that that to me feels more of like and, and the ripple effect let's say everybody did that mm -hmm. instead of listening to the demands of our culture whatever they may be yeah well then you you start people start 
organizing a little bit differently within their communities or and then when they organize a little bit differently in their communities they organize the state a little bit differently which organizes the country a little bit differently and then you kind of have that ripple effect and then maybe who knows maybe you don't need those overarching like i'm the federal government i'm not saying and the federal government i might be i might be saying and the federal government i don't know i mean you know if we all just live by the policy and don't be a dick I think the world would just run a whole lot smoother. Don't be a dick. That should just be plastered in every single language across every single airport into America. You and know, out. you know, you're really speaking on the golden rule that has existed throughout all of all of humanity. And nobody can follow it. The golden rule. Everybody's a dick. Like, we all just need to kind of take a step back for a second. And if you would just stop for, like, three seconds and think to yourself, am I being a dick? You might get through your day a little bit easier. You know what I'm saying? That would solve everything. Every problem a human being could have this way, not physically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they weren't being a dick. Could be solved. You want that new job? Don't be a dick. You want that raise at work? Don't be a dick. You want to date that girl? Guess what? Don't be a dick. I don't know. Some girls like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have too. It's wild. I've seen it firsthand. Poor things. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I have, tr in that regard, I have trouble being a dick. Sorry, ladies. <laughs> Man, I don't get that. Be mean to me. Be mean to me. Let me love you and you just be mean in return and I'll just feel way better about life. Where do you think that stems from? From the female perspective. Where do I think that stems from? Yeah, where do you think that stems from? Give like the give the the female psychology behind that. Where that stems from, I think that is stemmed from a long, long lineage of, you know. Even back to your back to your hunters and gatherers, kings and queens. Okay. Yeah. Ye who had the nuts controlled everything. And it's been that way yeah. for thousands of years. Pharaohs and tribe leaders and whatever the fuck else was out there. Mm -hmm. Men have always women were always the healers, the gatherers, the the love and the companionship and the glue. The men were the ones that were big, strong and made decisions. And it's been that way forever. Whoever decided that, you were wrong. That's fair. Like, I don't think that that's how that should have gone. That's fair. But I understand where it comes from, too. Yeah. You know, men bring strength and bravery and all of that towards the table. And I could see how you would want somebody that embodies those things mm -hmm. to be in charge, to control that situation right you want a a you want in theory you want the the king of the or whatever the man to pick up his sword and lead the art lead the right. the people into battle and just dis, dis, display his bravery and his courage and all that and it's interesting i think you i think we've forgotten the natural like what is a because there are differences between men and women regardless of what society wants to tell us nowadays um We've we've really disconnected from the what is what is a man naturally good at versus what is a woman naturally good at? You know, when you start right. asking those questions, it doesn't mean a man should hold all the positions of power in government. It doesn't yeah. mean a, a woman should always be I don't know whatever the, whatever women have been subjected to for the last hundred years. You know, that was a real quick dig to a hole. I was waiting for you to go down it. <laughs> Oh, you want me to <laughs> dig into what women no, have been subjected no. to for the last hundred years? No, I thought you were going a total another way with that. And I was like, oh, goodness gracious. Oh, no, 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 look like when they're working in in unity and in harmony and i don't think we've seen that for however many years if we've ever if we've ever seen that at least we probably haven't seen that in our own lifetimes so we kind of need to go back to like storytelling and whatever it may be oh the cat has joined us not in the picture oh yeah she kind of is 
kind of on the camera a little bit, but so I, it's, it's tough. Cause you know, I think the, the you know, words like toxic masculinity are thrown around nowadays a lot. And it's like, yeah. I think toxic mass, I don't think masculinity is a problem. I think a lack of true healthy masculinity is the problem. Right. right? And it, it, it presents itself in these like, look at my fucking huge nuts on this on alpha on macho and it, you know and it's kind of like overcompensating for deeply rooted insecurities and fear and you know a need to try and possess and control because that's what i don't know that's what the, they're taught in right. a sense you know and so i don't know i think we kind of need to we need to take a little bit of a step back and evaluate it again in ourselves right well what is the healthiest expression of my own masculinity or femininity and if a, if a woman does that, what is the healthiest expression of my femininity? Maybe she'll realize men don't need to be dicks. <laughs> well, like I said, you know, you can you can drink too much water. You, you can kill yourself on water. You know, you can have too much masculinity. You can have mm -hmm. too much femininity. You know, and I, that's not saying that there should be a lack thereof or a force driving you to have more. But... You can overdo it one way or another. And, you know, women overdo it just the same as men do. You know, they overcorrect. They, you know, try to fall into whatever shape they can find. They try to belong. They try to find a missing piece. And they'll overcorrect for those things. Hmm. And that's what they were taught by their mothers. Find a husband, be a wife, have some kids, grow up, have a home. So they've got to find somewhere they fit. And a lot of women overcompensate for that. Just by falling into the role, they overcompensate. Yeah. And they kind of, do you think they sacrifice their, their individual self in that process? I really think a, a lot of women do. Marriage shouldn't be a sacrifice of self, ever. Mm. You should never have to sacrifice your own self to become one half of two people. Because in theory, it's supposed to be two people coming together to create a unity between the two where you create you know it's it's like you create one unit but two it's a unit that's made up of two holes instead of a two you know instead of sacrificing half right right it's two paths that come together to form the same road to travel in the same direction two paths that come together to travel the same road that's beautiful that's a beautiful thing <laughs> good word thank you did you just come up with that one i did Hot off the cuff. <laughs> and you said you're not made for the internet. Not made for the internet. <laughs> made for the philosophy books, I suppose. Well, you know, just a philosopher over here. Me too. It's a miserable existence, isn't it? Just awful. <laughs> the brain never stops. <laughs> Always thinking on the, the ways of the world and how to solve the end times. I understand. Oh, you know, at just 3 a.m., that's all I think about. Yeah, tell me your three a. What's it? Tell me a. Th tell me your three a.m. thoughts. I don't think you want my three a.m. thoughts. They're mostly '90s infomercials and that one really embarrassing thing I did in fourth grade. That's pretty much my three a.m. thoughts. You know what I heard? Never believe a word you tell about yourself after nine p.m. I remember that stuff so vividly. <laughs> Never believe a word you tell about yourself after 9 p.m. Yeah, gotcha. And look at it. it's 10 20 p.m. So a word that we say about ourselves right now. Wrong. Wrong. We can't believe it. So don't So there goes that philosopher thing. Yeah, there goes that there goes <laughs> everything. There goes everything we just said totally out the window. I I was being philosophical. I was wrong. Well, that doesn't mean you're not philosophical. <laughs> There's a reason I brought you onto the podcast. True philosopher brain. Yeah, something like that. A gift and a curse. Every day. <laughs> struggle Every, internally. Every day it's a struggle? Let me tell you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, give me one of your 3 a.m. thoughts. Give me a, all right, give me a 3 a.m. thought. Not about yourself, but about life. About life? Yeah, give me a, a 3 a.m. thought. Give me a 3 a.m. philosophy about life. Philosophy about life. Yeah. We spend way too much time looking at the sky. Interesting. Why? We're so focused on what's going on up there, we forget that there's shit going on here. 
Wow. What is there? All right. What? So what are we forgetting here? We look at the stars for a new planet in case something happens to this one. We destroy our own planet every day. Hmm. We look at the stars for another species when we've only looked at 5% of the ocean and have discovered none of those. So you think, you know, what's interesting. All right. Because I love looking up at the sky. I love stargazing. It gives me a little bit of a sense of hope. But there's this, there's this song. One of the one of the most more important songs in my life, it's called "Through Glass" by Stone Sour. I don't know if you know that song, but one of the things it says in the chorus it says the stars they lie to you. Is that what you're is that what you're kind of referring to? I think it gives false hope. False hope. Would you call hope a poor man's plea? I would call hope a safety net. So if not hope, what? <laughs> humans don't have a whole lot else if not hope nature if not hope nurture if not hope love why does it have to be hope I hope I fall in love I hope my world doesn't explode I hope we find another planet soon I hope I have drinkable water or how about I love that I have drinkable water I love that I live on this awesome planet I love that I have these people around me why are we so focused on I hope, I wish, I think, instead of I do, I love, I've done? Oof. Oof. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> oh, my God. That's like, you're speaking my language. <laughs> you're speaking my language. Because there is a, there's a great interview I watched probably a couple of years ago. But one of the clips I always see resurfaced on Instagram. Is this guy named uh, Dick Gregory? He's he's dead now, but he was asked about hope. He said, "Oh," and he was this, this old guy. <laughs> this old guy. He's, he's the way he speaks is funny. He's like, "Hope, I don't deal in hope. Hope, fucking hope. Hope ain't gonna pay your bills. Hope ain't going You hope you're gonna go to trip to Paris. You just told a trillion cells in your body you ain't going to Paris, right? <laughs> right. He's like, you gotta get your ass out there and work. You hope your car gonna start. You right. better make that thing. <laughs> you know that's it exactly. So I think dealing in hope it kind of it it outsources our own actual ability to to create and to magnify change and to be change and to be love and to wow that's a that's a profound idea we spend too much time looking at the sky looking for hope looking for whatever is out there when it's all right here yeah that's like people that say you know i live by the bible because i want to get into heaven how about you live a good life so that you can be happy like mm. that's ridiculous why would you live just enough to get into something you don't know is there instead of doing good in the place that you do live like that makes no sense to me it's like hoping i get there yeah hoping exactly and the thing about that is there's no nobody's perfect no right nobody is going to be this perfect embodiment like if you look at the story this idea of who is jesus is this perfect fucking right. figure right and it's an unrealistic expectation to expect that we are going to be this this person right. this and you just got to believe you know you'll be you'll be you'll get there you just got to believe you just got to hope you just got to put all that in there and it creates like a a sense of never being good enough i'm never going to be good enough i'm i'm i can't be that i can't oh well, no never so I, I i get what you're saying and it's wow it's it's really interesting that we can't just be here Right. Be present. Choose to love. Embrace this beautiful planet that we have. All right, because I think there's great mysteries up in the sky and in the stars. And Absolutely. I've had plenty of alien encounters and, you know, cool, seeing cool shit up in the sky. So maybe there's a time and a place for it. But the time and place is only when you actually tend to your crops. Mm -hmm. That is nuts. I can't believe you just said that. You really are a philosopher. You really are a philosopher. So if we're not going to leave people with hope, 
if hope isn't going to change anything, where would you send people? Where where are you going to tell them to go? Because people want to go. They want they want they need they need something to grasp onto, right? And I think all a lot of times people only grasp onto hope. Yeah. So if you rip that away from people, you take away hope. Take away hope. What do you get? What is left? You give them family. Hmm. You don't need hope when you have support. You don't need hope when you have love. You don't need hope when other people lift you up. Because when you look for hope, is that really all you're looking for? Or are you looking for companionship? Or are you looking for a family? Or are you looking for peace? Those are things you'll never find in hope. Hope doesn't bring peace. That brings more chaos than peace to anybody. I hope my daughter survives. I hope I pass this test. That gives me anxiety. I don't mm. want to hope for nothing. I just want to do that. It's like the yearning itself. The yeah. craving and yearning for it creates a an inner angst. and All on its own. Hmm. Do away with hope. Okay. Okay. So do you not, you don't, you don't hope for things. I don't hope for anything. I just want it to happen. And I'm so not, you, so you make it happen. I want to make it happen. And if I can't make it happen, I'm not going to hope for it because it's way too far out of my league to worry about above my pay grade. I could say I hope for world peace. I can't make that happen. You can only, you can only be peaceful yourself. Right. I only want peace. Hmm. Instead of world peace, instead of a test, stamping right. a label on it. Yeah. Not your monkeys, not your circus. Exactly. And if everybody played like that, we would have no monkeys or circus. People love the circus. Oh, yeah. Give them breads and circuses, they'll never revolt. That is true. But you'll always have a circus with humans. So do you think hope is a natural biological tendency? Yeah. I think people cling to it because they mistake other feelings for hope. Such as? Sadness. Mm. Happiness. Self-absorption. All of what do you, it. What do you mean self-absorption? Everything stems from hope. Somebody that only cares for themselves. Somebody that only thinks they're the best. Somebody that only has their needs on their mind are hoping that caring that much about themselves might make them feel a little better. They're hoping that if they have that attitude and put out that aura, somebody else will notice them. Again, companionship, family, connection. Hmm. It all comes back to, to hope. To the deeply... So hope is a longing for a return to the things that really matter. When the reality is just sitting there hoping for it is never going to bring exactly. those things in. I think hope is a cover word. I think hope replaces people's feelings. And it's a way to bypass the feelings? Yeah. If you're really sad about something, you know, let's say your cat got sick. Okay. I really hope my cat gets better. So instead of processing that sadness... And the fact that you may have to put your cat down, you're going to sit there and not deal with that feeling and just hope she gets better. Oh, and instead of actually bypassing the, instead of actually sitting in the pain, yes. processing that it's there, finding a level of acceptance, right? you kind of create a fantasy. Exactly. Creating a, okay. I hope get it. misleading. That's why, the, that's why the stars lie, huh? Hmm. Oh, man, I don't know how to, I don't know how to like, <laughs> I agree with you yeah. because I've, in the next poetry book that I'm putting out in about, it's going to be a month or two. The third poem in the book is called a poor man's plea. And it's about hope. Yeah. It's about hope is not enough. Yeah. So this is something I've sat with myself, but I still find, I still find myself hoping for things as a way to rationalize 
certain aspects, certain emotions, certain yeah. ways of, you know, well, this is where I am now. Let me rationalize my emotions. Let me rationalize all of this by hoping for a better future. Is that still bypassing, you think? I think so. Yeah. You're hoping for a better future. Instead of doing it. Instead of creating a better future. Hmm. You're bypassing that need to process where you're at, which may not be completely 100% where you want to be. Yeah. And there are fig feelings lingering to that particularly that you might need to deal with or you might need to process or sit with. And so hoping for a better future instead of taking inventory of your present and actually dealing with those problems kind of bypasses and again is a band-aid is a net for those feelings to get caught in so you can process them later or not at all you've done some deep inner work done a lot of thinking <laughs> <laughs> you've done some deep well i can no i can tell you've done some deep inner work because you don't just you don't actually come up well hello luna thank you welcome welcome to the show she's there she is you don't actually come into terms with the reality of of what hope is in this example or what these emotions are and where we are and, you know, being in the present moment without actually setting in motion, right. right? Without actually doing the work. And sometimes I think it's very easy to think you're doing inner work and then in reality you're outsourcing it to external sources external modalities and the same thing i found even with poetry right you can write to process your emotions but at what point there was a there was a great podcast i did with this guy uh, his name was gnu roxwell and he's a poet songwriter does all these like different uh forms of artwork and he said at what point are you just pimping your pain and using it to like ruminate on it and just never let go of it and you, it becomes your identity and you're writing everything about that you're doing everything around that instead of actually processing it yeah you hope for a better future you hope it goes away but you really don't because it is create it is a source of an infinite well of your perceived creativity right for your perceived misery Right. Right? And so you hold on to it tightly without act and you hope you hope it goes away, but you don't hope it go away at the same time. Right. And so it's it's a very, very it's it's like walking a tightrope. You know? It's a very fine line that you're walking on where you tell yourself you're doing inner work. But you ain't actually doing inner work. You ain't actually taking the steps to change. Right. And that I can tell. You navigate that tightrope very well with the um, with the way you're able to articulate these ideas and express these because that's not you've been through pain, but you you actually acknowledge it and you actually accept it and you actually do something about it as opposed to just you know getting to the point where you know you're in it. Oh, but it's okay. It's what I've known. It's what I you know. Let me, so kudos to you. Thank you. That's that's some good shit right there. It's been a long year. It's been a long year. 2024 for a lot of people. I don't know how into like numerology or any of that stuff you're into. But I remember hearing at the very beginning of 2024, somebody told me that it was going to be a year where everybody's old karma starts running off yeah. in a sense. Where like everything that you've ever done, you're going to be smacked with in the face. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I've got punch, kick, thrown in a well. Man, I feel like karma's come back tenfold. I yeah. deserve it. I know I do. Yeah. But I'll take it. I'm not happy about it. I'm going to complain the whole time. But I'll take it. <laughs> and I, I definitely feel the same way in a sense where it's like, okay, I see the totality of who I've been. Yeah. And that's not who I am. Right. right? So there's a level of processing. And accepting, okay, I probably deserve this one. I probably deserve that one. I probably deserve that one. Yeah. Sometimes it feels like a kick in the nuts, though, and I'm like, did I really deserve yeah. that? Yeah. I'm like, did I really deserve that? That was unnecessary. Hmm. Do you believe in past lives? Yes. Tell me more. <laughs> Tell me more. Because no, I, the reason I ask that is sometimes I wonder if certain karma stems from certain past lives. Okay. Like, if I did some shit in a past life, like... Maybe I didn't fully process that in an old lifetime. Right. 
in the, the circumstances that I'm living in now is based on the karma of an old past life. And I still have to work through that. So maybe I don't even, maybe I don't even have a specific trauma. Maybe I don't even have a specific reason I'm going through specific like shit that I can consciously be aware of, yeah. but it's old karma from a past life that I need to work through. So my idea on past lives is that we have soul bonds and we have soul contracts and we go through every single life learning. And that's why I believe that there are old souls and there are new souls. So when you do pass away, you see all of the people that it left before you. You get to talk to all of those old soul bonds that you were meant to meet during your lifetime and you can choose to stay there with those people or you can choose to move on and continue to learn. And most people choose to move on and continue to learn because I believe there are levels of enlightenment in a soul. Old soul, new soul, that kind of stuff. Um, once you reach a certain point, it's like heaven, but it's just a full conscious relaxation. Like everything that you were, everything that you've become, everything that you are you finally know true peace mm. once you finally hit that level. So I think you get to go, you get to see all these people and you go into just for visualization purposes, like a hallway with a bunch of screens and you get to review that life. You get to review your mistakes and you you get to see the things you had to do, the soul contracts you had to make, the soul bonds you had to be a part of, the soul mates you had to meet. And you come back together with those same souls and you say, hey, do we want to do it again? And everybody just starts over. So I believe the people in your life you've had for many lifetimes. And they always come back to you in one form or another. So there's never any lost love. Mm -hmm. It's always coming back. So I believe that the karma that we feel in our everyday life is kind of like a warning. Like you've done this before. Don't you remember like a kick in the pants to kind of be like, you've already fucked this up in a past life. You can't do it again. And I believe that's what karma is, is just correction instead of punishment. I like that. I like correction instead of punishment. I, You're speaking my language because that is <laughs> that's very much, the, the, I would say, to a T, the perspective I have on past lives and the people in our lives. Cause I remember one time I, you know, I've done a lot of like deep meditation and a lot of deep inward work. And I remember one time I had this, I don't know. I, I was, this is when I first got to South Dakota a few years ago. First time I was here. I remember out of nowhere, I just got so fucking tired and I literally went upstairs in my room and I was like, I just need to sit down. So I sat on the fucking floor and just went out mm -hmm. out on the floor and i had this deep like it was like a dream it wasn't really a dream because i don't know if i was i don't know if i was asleep i don't know but it, it was me going through all these fucking lifetimes all of these experiences i remember dying i remember experiencing every sensation under the sun in different forms i was human i was not human i would see people that i knew but they weren't in the same body like it was a different person but i'm like oh what's up andrew like yeah. yo what's good dude anyway you know and it was it was like so i would and i'd see all the death too i'd see the death of every single one of them and i remember right before i woke back up i saw this like grand visualization of earth right and it was look and i was looking at it i was literally sitting there like man fuck that shit <laughs> literally i was sitting there like yeah. I don't feel like doing that again. But then I had a, a, it was an image of my family members. It had like the life I was living now. And there was like beauty and there was all these things that like, oh, but you can do all this. And I was like, all right, sign me up again. Yeah. Let's go. Sign me up one more time. And then I heard this like divine fucking voice. It said, open your eyes. And I opened my eyes and I was on my fucking floor, <laughs> like Jeez. laying on my back. And I was back. I was like, holy shit. Like it was, I might have. I don't know. Oh my gosh! Very possible. That's crazy. And then, I mean, I've had other, you know, dr I guess you could call them dreams too, where you know I have a similar thing where I fucking go out mm -hmm. and I have a dream of me and you know that I, I just had one a couple of weeks ago with me and Tony, for example. You met Tony. Shout out to Tony. I know he watched. He watches all the fucking podcasts. What's good, dude? <laughs> 
where I, him and I were in like a fucking palace. Like it was, he was the fucking king. I was one of like his, I was like a, like the hand of the king almost where I'm like his primary, like council. And like, we were just fucking going through life. And like, we had all these experiences and it was such a long dream. It was like, it felt like I was in there fucking weeks, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And like it had, and it was rich in detail and the people there and the experiences and the love and had family and this and that. And it, it, it just felt more like a memory of this is what him and I have done before. Right. You know, we were in this fucking court palace, whatever, right. living this life. And to me, that felt like another past life memory where it's like, okay, that's so familiar. Like you can't tell me that that world was not real at some point. Right. right? And so, I, I very much agree that it almost seems undeniable the soul has a greater journey than just the end, our one individual human experience. Right. And once we exit this body, that, that's why I'm fascinated by the concept of Judgment Day, where you see all them fucking screens, you see all the shit you did. That's like, all right, let me learn, let me grow, let me be accountable, let me, yeah. let me, let me take ownership for all of that. And I like to think. If I were to die right now, yeah. I'd be, I, I have to, I have to, there's judgment day in yeah. a sense. Right. So I almost try and live as if every single day is my day of day of, and it, and sometimes when you say judgment day, it's like a negative almost like, like people, yeah. people have a negative connotation with that idea of being forced to stand before God and, and own all your sins or whatever, you know, whatever the fuck it is. People fear that, but I, I really I, I look forward to that moment right. where I can actually look at my whole life and and be forced to look at every single aspect. Yeah. Like I I want to do that. I enjoy I, I enjoy doing that. Not that I I don't know there's shit that's difficult and there's you know even the last ever since I got back to South Dakota the last time, yeah. more than a half ago, 2 months ago, like there's been shit that's come up in my own life where it's like damn, I have not looked at this fully. I did not process this experience. Right. I need to do some deeper work with that. I need to forgive this person. I need to forgive myself. It's not my fault in some of this, you know, when you're a fucking kid, it's not your fault. Some of the shit that happens to you, the up, whatever, whatever it is. So, and I think the, the judgment day is that it, 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 it can be, you can use that concept to really give yourself some grace on this human human experience and kind of kind of go through life with a little bit more accountability and how you want to show up because like i'd hate to be at the end of my life on my deathbed or go up and have my little soul meeting around all the screens and be like you fucked up here you fucked up there you fucked up there look at you you're a piece of shit here you're a piece of shit there you knew better there you knew better there like i want to go up there and celebrate like wow we fucking rocked this one you know what i mean like that's what so. that's what it should be all about. If that's what you need it to be about, yeah, that's what life should be. Is whatever you think it should be about. Yeah. And people don't fear judgment; they fear nothingness. They fear nothingness. Person can go. Person could die tomorrow, and they know if they knew for a fact, tomorrow they would be judged, heaven or hell. They'd be okay with that. They don't fear the judgment. They okay. fear that that judgment's not going to happen. Mm. Once they close their eyes, it's just black. So everything you did was for nothing. Everything you tried to do was for nothing. You were a good person. You didn't swear on Sundays. You didn't hurt children. You did all of this for what? Nothing. Mm. People don't fear judgment if they know it's going to be there. And they don't fear the punishment or the reward. They fear that it's not going to be there at the end. That's a good way to look at it. I never thought of it that way, but I think you're right. Yeah. People fear death because they view it as... The end. The end. Permanent. Yeah. And that's scary. That's terrifying. People come up with ways to deal with that. Heaven, hell, reincarnation. Mm-hmm tell themselves a story and attach and hope bring it back to hope they hope their story is what holds up now now how did you how did you come to this understanding about the soul why do you why do you think that's how it goes and it is funny because we held, we hold a very similar belief and the ways we probably came about it are 
we have our two separate lives. I mean, I didn't even know you existed three weeks ago. So how did you come to that? Make that your primary foundational belief in that regard? Because I think I've seen it and I think I've felt it and I think I've watched it happen. That's from my own personal experience. You know, a lot of the people that have been around me in my lifetime, I have felt I've known them before. Mm -hmm. We've walked this path together. I have a couple people in my life that are absolutely soulmates. Yeah. Whether and that's not I'm in love with you, da da da. That is actual like we were just bonded. There's nothing I can do about that. We were meant to find each other one way or another. You're my sister, you're my brother, you're my friend, whatever that was for them. That's what I needed. I came to that through a lot of death and a lot of dealing with death and a lot of birth and watching people grow. I've seen new souls and old souls. I've seen people who are 65 and have no clue how to deal with their anger. And I've seen 15-year-old boys get beat and hold their tongue because they would never. I've mm. seen people learn the hard way, and I've seen people just pick it up. I think that that's why there is no learning disability. There is no somebody slow. Somebody's just new at this. Really fucking new at it. This soul is new at the game. So you know what? Yeah, it's got a couple of glitches in it. And it has no idea what's going on. Sure. And then that's why you have people like Einstein and, you know, Martin Luther King and all of those people that had something to say, something profound, something worth it, something with substance. Mm. It's because they'd already been here. They knew. They knew what was going on from the day they took their first step. That soul knew that it was meant for something. Mm. And they step into it yeah. without hesitation because they've been around the block quite a few times. Yeah, they've already done did it. <laughs> we already did this shit. Let's yeah. just get it over with. Yeah. What's going on? You fear death? Every day. But I've made peace with that fear. I fear death. Everybody fears death. Everybody can say they don't. Hmm. But if you were laying on your deathbed, that thought wouldn't flash through your head. Shit, I wonder what happens next. I don't know if the so. I think the um, because that's an interesting question. Because I wouldn't say I fear death, but I I I respect death for what it is in a sense, right? There isn't like a um. Because when I think of fear, I think of something that's almost paralyzing in a sense. But you could say I fear death because I'm hesitant to jump off a fucking tall cliff. Right. Right. So I'm very mindful. It's a spectrum. Yeah. It's weird because I've made peace with it as well. Yeah. Very, very at peace with it. When the time comes, the time comes. Right. I'm not, I'm, am I going to welcome it with open arms? Well, probably not that, but right. it is what it is. It's what happens. I can't do anything about it. Yeah. Why fight it? Yeah. But at the same time, there's a respect for the, the preciousness of life and the gift that we're here. So, because I think, I think the thing that paralyzes people is that fear. Maybe it's the fear of nothingness, but I think that's a man that's in aspect. What is nothingness? It's death. And I think the fear of death is so prominent in our culture. It prevents people from truly living their lives in a meaningful way. Absolutely. That's to me, that feels like the because we, we live in a culture anti death, yeah, anti death. All of our technology, anti death, yep. I want to live forever, I want to live forever, yeah. <laughs> I want to, and th there is no, I, I don't, I don't care what technology they put out there, there's no living forever, personally. I wouldn't want to live forever. I mean, there's studies, and there's been some. You know, advancement in the yeah, but you, You're going to put it like a... Cells are regenerative. Regenerative. Yeah. Right? So if cells can t consistently regenerate, the only thing that breaks down are chromosomes, I believe. Mm -hmm. And if that's the only thing that breaks down, if you can replace those chromosomes or rebuild them with something, then you would have infinite life. But is but it? Really don't want to get into that. Is it our? But is it our place to do that? Why not? But why? But why not? That's the thing. Why is it immoral? No, I wouldn't say it's immoral. 
Is it wrong? But my my question is, what are we striving for? Maybe forever. Maybe space exploration. Maybe world peace. Maybe I just want to live old enough to see the planet explode. You know, does there have to be a purpose for it? Or can we, again, just kind of do it? That There is no, you know, you're playing God. Let's all just sit here and believe there's not one for a second. Okay. We play we play God with everything. Yeah. Everything. Our crops, our cattle, our our babies. We create babies in test tubes on a pretty regular basis. We pick out eggs, we pick out sperm, we pick out what animals to breed, we pick out we play God every single day. So why not play with that? I don't, I don't have a reason why or why not. Yeah, you know. I think if somebody wants to do that, yeah. by, all all means, yeah. by all means, by all means, I think it's... You should force it. No, right. You know. Me, I actually... One thing I do look forward to is I look forward to the aging process. Do you? Yeah. Because I want, I want to experience... Because to me, I, I think one of my biggest fears is stagnation. And if I go through life, you know, I, I know what I like. I know what I'm interested in. I, and I, I guess in theory, as long as I'm continually exploring, then there wouldn't be any stagnation. And if you're looking at space exploration, you're looking at this. There is an infinite amount that we can explore. So I could see how certain immortality, the promise of immortality could, you could in theory, you check the box like you, uh, for what I would need. It would be explorative uncovering unraveling the mysteries of the universe because you can't ever truly get to the answer but i also very much look forward to the experience you know we're in physical bodies i look forward to the experiences of the changing of my physical body how am i going to show up when i'm old and you know i have an old body and i'm so i'm so attached to my youth in a sense right, right. i'm young i'm in shape i'm, I'm i got a pep in my step how am I going to show up for myself when I don't have those things? Right. You know, I think it, it would be an inch. Like, that's a part of my own soul's journey that I've in this in this body, at least, I think I'm meant to experience. Yeah. So for me, the idea is living forever. I don't really need to do that. Like, personally, that's yeah. my own. I understand. You know, because I, I kind of want to go through the aging process. Do I want to be old and injured and all these things? No, but it'll be a challenge to see how I how well I can maintain myself as i go through the aging process that we've all gone through before and maybe in some other lifetime i come back and i want to do the whole immortality thing whatever i don't know but even then i tend to think the like who's to say we're not immortality and i end up with a bullet in my head right it's gonna come to an end at some point right even with the promise of immortality so i don't know i guess it's an interesting field of exploration but it's not one i'm Attaching myself to, I suppose. I don't know. Would you live forever if you could? Yeah. Yeah? Absolutely. I would live for all eternity if they'd let me. Who's to say you don't already do that through different bodies in your soul? Who's to say? I truly think that I do, but I'd like to be able to remember the entire experience. It's an interesting way to put it. I like that. I like that. Actually learn from it. Instead of having to do it again. Instead of having to remember. Yeah, instead of having to try to figure it out. Maybe that's the next, like, step in evolution. Maybe. I don't. I have no idea where evolution is going. That's the beauty. I'm yeah. sure they didn't know 20,000 years ago. Yeah, well, you know, 99% of all animals that have ever walked this earth are extinct. We will soon be the next species to go extinct. At some point, yeah. And I don't think it'll be as fast as everybody thinks it is. I do. All right. When do you think it will happen? If we don't change our ways, give it another 150 years. Okay. We'll either lose, lose ourselves to pollution, earthquakes, a super volcano, or, you know, just mass murder, societal collapse, hunger. Okay water pollution i tend to think based on what we were talking about at the very beginning where people thrive in chaos 
when we are tested in that way, we're not going to have 8 billion people walking the planet after, but there will be a, there will be a, a group that is able to mitigate the chaos or groups that are able to mitigate the chaos. So I think the extension of human life in some form, I mean, unless the planet becomes totally uninhabitable, right. then you're looking at something different, right. but I really I, think we're just ready for a population control set. Think so. Oh, for sure. There's way too many of us. I don't I, I disagree with that. I don't think there's so? too many. I don't, I don't think there's too many. Oh, really? Cause you could take every single person in the world and if you gave, if you spread it out properly, every single person could have, I want to say it's like 50 acres of themselves. And that, that's just on habitable land. On habitable? Yeah. We're talking about habitable, um, you can crops, all that. It's just because of the way we condense ourselves into city environments, right. urban environments. The, so, and you look at places like India and China and the terrible right. living conditions. So, I mean, if we organize ourselves properly, every family could have about 50 acres. Right. So I don't- that's family. I, well, right, but I don't. So I don't think there's too many people. I think there's too many people based on the organization system and how we condense ourselves into these city environments. And we, you know, I don't think our system is meant to have this many people. Right. I but, don't think the world is supposed to have this many people. Eh, I maybe. really don't. I think that we've become too big for our own britches. But then again, now we're on a birth decline, and we have been for years. And they are damn near begging us to have babies. That's correct. Well, there will be a population collapse in that regard. Oh, yeah. I'll be there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not going to do my part in the collapse, though. I'm going to pump, I'm gonna pump out babies. Yeah. <laughs> pump out babies. I'm highly fertile. Highly fertile. Yeah? Yeah. So you're birthing them. Well, I'm not the one. Oh. They're not coming out of my... They're coming out of my body. So you got to you gotta find someone to birth those. Yes. A lot of women don't do that anymore. Cats I'll find, are hard. That's what cats are for. I'll find one that does. Find one that does. Highly fertile. Highly fertile. Yeah. Glad. Glad. <laughs> poor, poor kids, man. Oh, they're in for something. They're in for something. Something special. All right, well, it's like 11 o'clock. What do you say we wrap it up? Yeah, we do. Let's wrap it up. Okay. Got anything you want to leave them with? Me neither. Not a single thing. Dope. Baller. Baller, huh? That's going to wrap up the episode. We'll see you next time. All right. Thank you, Libby, for coming on the podcast. Quite the way to end that one. Quite the way to end that one. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. If you're a fan, be sure to subscribe whatever platform you are on. YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, you all know how to do that. Be sure to purchase a copy of my book to marshal love against tyranny be on the lookout for my next poetry collection which will be coming out in the very near future if you're watching this later on it's a very good chance that it's already out so be on the lookout for that head on over to my substack mcdermott.substack.com special thank you to our official sponsor tranquil desires in chamberlain south dakota if you stop in say evan from the fifth dimension sent you it's going to wrap up this episode. Be sure to subscribe because there are many great interviews, many great episodes, topics that we're going to be continuing to explore here on the fifth dimension in the near future. And I'm very excited for the direction that we are moving as a show. So I don't want you guys to miss out. Be sure to check it out. Be sure to subscribe. Be sure to follow your heart and the calls of whatever it may take you. And if that means subscribing to this channel, do just that. Without further ado, I will see you all on the next episode. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day, and I thank you all for tuning in.